Okay, well, welcome. I'm talk I'm Catherine Lyon, and I'm talking to Catherine Lord or Cath Cat Lord. Yeah. I never know what to call you. <laughs> My children call me Cat, so that's fine. <laughs> oh, okay. But on your books, you're Catherine, you see. Yeah. That's <laughs> for me. I'm a Catherine, but I'm spelt differently. So there you go. <laughs> so we're here to talk about children's environments and whether we do too much for children, whether we put them in cotton wool, where's the balance between protecting them and allowing them to find out and discover and do things for themselves really yeah now uh, we have a very small audience at the moment but last time we did this this is the second spark debate people came on a bit later and we did get people talking to us in the end so i actually got one of your books here it's not the <laughs> book you think i've got it's the other one whoa <laughs> i was just <laughs> i was just noticing this and um I will, I will apologise to any people that happen to be male that watch this recording on YouTube in the future. But I just think this is lovely because this is what perhaps tonight will be all about. Not necessarily about the women, but about earliest practitioners. So my original idea for writing this other book yeah. came from being at a conference where the whole premise was women inspiring women. Well, tonight... <laughs> we don't mind which gender people are yeah. <laughs> um, we just want to inspire people and uh, not only did i want to be one of those but i realized we all have the power to inspire each other and that's what i hope we'll get out of tonight because actually i think this subject i think this subject is quite bland but that might be okay. because of my, <laughs> my personal practice and it might be, and your personal practice too, which is very obvious, but other people, and I've certainly seen it in settings where the adults are always clearing up. You know, the children just discard things and all the, all the staff do, all the educators do is to pick things up and put them back. And if they're a pack away, then they've got a whole host of tidying up at the end of the day. Um, okay. And I think that's really unfortunate. What do you think? Um, well, in terms of actual tidying up, I think we can empower our children to learn that habit for themselves, which in their future for their life skills is really important because when they're at their desk, let's assume they're having a desk job, you have to have things in a certain place so then it makes your work easier. Um, but also, if we're always tidying up, do you mean we're tidying up as a, along the way? Or do you mean we get everything Sometimes. out? Sometimes. Because the, the, there's two sides to that. If you... so. I was actually watching an amazing speech by Alistair Bryce Clegg and he's talking about Pinterest and the picture perfect and he's saying that is absolute rubbish um, and actually what our children need is the mess and all the different textures and all the different things for them to explore whereas if we only give them so, like he was he has a hilarious he's hilarious but he had a hilarious um, uh, anecdote about saying they were making a snowman and they had to put the hat there and they had to put the carrot there and then they shipped them off to get the other 40 children through because it was like a factory line and that's the children aren't learning anything there so that's why we don't want to tidy up or we don't want to have specific um resources out and then put them away as soon as they've used them we actually want them to learn and explore and and have those mm. but then on the other side where you say they've got all the toys and they just throw them on the floor and then at the end of the day that that's an, that's the other end of the spectrum as in this causes overwhelm there's too many things to do and they don't actually do anything purposefully they can't learn because they're distracted too much mm. however if I was working in a Montessori nursery, everything has a place and the child selects, they do their three part lesson and they put the equipment back where it should be. Yeah. And I and I do think that in a um, early years environment that children should respect the equipment, they should respect the environment for the other children and there should be an element of that in nursery. Yeah, definitely. Well, even it's one of the um, one of the 
<laughs> I forgot the words. Um, it's one of the statements in the early years about books. Obviously, I'm obsessed with books. My first book is There's More to Books Than Reading. And it's actually one of the statements is that they take care of the books. They know how to handle them and they don't stand on them. They don't rip them. And it is about taking care of our belongings. Funnily enough, in my settings or in, in the homes, when it's a library book, everybody tends to take more care of it because it's not just ours and it's for other people. And I just wish everyone would feel that way about every book. Then um, I used to be a DT coordinator and then in my nanny roles, I've turned into What's like- that? The, Oh, the What's design, that? I was a design technology co coordinator um, for in three schools actually. And now being on the nanny side, parents bring me books and say, can you help me with, you know, the pop-up books or the, the ones with oh, the moving yes. part. <laughs> so luckily I do know how to fix them, but, and, and sometimes it is that their fine motor skills aren't as developed as we wish, but it is about caring for our things and, and instilling it into our children that this is precious and we want to use it for a long time. Mm, that's really, yeah, I, I mean, in nursery life, we don't tend to have many pop-up books no, or they get ruined. <laughs> books that slide, yeah, with sliders in because they get ruined. I mean, if we've got a book with holes in, you know, where they can peek through the pages, yeah. that can be quite, uh, can I remember fabloning all those holes <laughs> to make them last longer yeah <laughs> so i have a i have a saying um about for nurseries in my nurseries that you we shouldn't do anything for a child that the child can do for themselves and i know that must be, that would be very difficult for for a parent because parents rush around like loopy loos they don't have enough time in the day to give their children time to think and do something. But I do think in nurseries and preschools, I think that's a really good motto. I think um, it should be the same in, in homes as well, actually. I know it's, okay. a, it, it's a long term thing. It's, it's hard at the beginning because you have to be patient, but making the environment so then that they are able to do it themselves. Yes, it takes time for them to learn because they've never done it. And I mentioned the fine motor skills before. It depends what you're talking about. But let's take the example of putting a coat on. If you can help, I, said, them. Yeah, I did say if they can do it for themselves, Kat. Yeah, no, you did. <laughs> um, but it it is about like giving them that time to be able to do it because in turn it will help the nursery settings because then they'll be able to do it too, won't they? Mm, the and practice makes perfect, as it were. But I say practice makes progression. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. That's re that's a really good saying, actually. I think um, someone else says that, but I say it too. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. We don't care where it's come from. I still think it's great. Mine might have been borrowed from somebody. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. So, so uh, I was going to say something. And I've forgotten about it. Uh, what were we talking about? Um, oh, practice makes perfect and all that. Well, you know, if we if we do give the children the time to practice, then obviously that gives us adults more time to do what we need to do in the longer term, mm -hmm. particularly in a busy nursery environment where, um, you know, there's always too many things to do. You're having yeah. to think on your feet all the time and you've got one round your leg and one on your lap and, yeah. and you've got to go and get snack, <laughs> you know. Um, so I do think we need to make, things as easy as possible for children okay <laughs> what do you think um i think what you were saying about montessori and what you're saying about um the children where they have things that they can reach and they can find and if they're labeled appropriately as in not just words because let's face it many of our children can't read uh, so yeah. their pictures as well um, but then that empowers the child to go and get the thing that they're thinking about or wanting rather than having to hang, hang on your leg because they're asking you for something, but you've got five other children that are also asking you for something. Um, so, but then it frees your time up to actually be able to go to the children that need your support because the other ones, they just need you to reach something down from a shelf or let's say something like that. Yeah. I mean, Kat's books are really quite thin. This is not the one. This is not the one about the environment. This is the, her book about books. Um, but I was really intrigued because I've always, um, with with something in your book, okay. Um, and there is a there is going to be a little film on the end of this, so okay. you can see the books. Um, 
but color for children is a really difficult concept okay. you know we tend to teach children about colors but they're really you know colors float about aren't, don't they you know one thing's blue and something else yeah. so it's a completely different yeah. shape yeah. Um, it might be something in 2D, 3D. It could be, you know, something huge. It could be something really small. You know, there are so many variables over yeah. the colour. I was and, just having a funny conversation today. Uh, my favourite colour is blue, and all the children know that. And they were like, what's your second favourite colour? And I said turquoise. And she went, but that's just blue. <laughs> I was like, well, there you go. <laughs> and um, in your book, you actually use colour in a really useful way. Would you like to explain that? Uh, yeah. So I believe in colour coordinating everything. I do even colour coordinate the food in my cupboards. But I'm not saying that you necessarily need to do that for your children. But if you colour coordinate your, their books, they know the favourite colour of their book. They'll know where to find it and they'll know where to put it back even before they can read. Um, and and I, I've seen that happen. I've seen it happen when I change the um, books, their shelves in many, many homes. And the next day I get a text saying my child has picked out a book that they've not read or my child constantly knows where to find the one that they're looking for. Even if you don't color coordinate it, them, they'll know where to find it because they know yes. what it looks like. They know what color it is. They know what it looks like. Even though they can't identify the color yeah. name. Yeah, um, but then they, they know that, that if it's a green book, it's with the green books. Yeah, as it were. yeah definitely. Yeah, I, so they can, it empowers them to put it back as well, which is what we were talking about earlier. We're looking after your things instead of leaving them all on the floor and then ending up standing on them. And then their favorite book gets ruined. It, that would be really sad for them. They would feel bad. Um, so, uh, and I've seen this as young as one. Children have been putting them back. I've seen it happen. Hmm. I mean, in nurseries now and preschools, there's a big emphasis on on small parts where they don't have a perceived play value a bit of an extension of heuristic play i feel that yeah. is and um yes they could be all sorted into shape into their bot into their plastic bottles or jars or what have you that's on the shelf but they could actually be sorted into colors couldn't they I guess that that's an open-ended task. You could let the child decide how they organise those because that's more of a learning opportunity than us telling them what they have to do. <laughs> well, yes, that's true. That's true. So you you do go into nurseries, don't you, and help them organise their environments. What sort of things do you find that they need help with? Um, for nurseries, they, I think they are great at this but it's wrote about rotation um i've got a quote like my own quote from my book you don't need the zoo and the farm out at the same time unless you're doing a specific activity about sorting animals and that just helps the nursery setting because and the and homes because they're not constantly separating those and tidying those toys unless you want to put all the animals together and have an animal section that's different um but also i really strongly feel about themed boxes rather than putting uh you have your books here and you have your colors here and you have uh your non-fiction there and then you have your toy dinosaurs and then you have i'm trying to think on my feet now jigsaws yes yeah, fine instead of having them all separate put them in, put them in a dinosaur box you'll find that they'll play a lot longer because they've got several different things to play with but they're all under the theme of dinosaurs, dinosaurs. and obviously we love um we it is right to do child-led themes so if you find that that child is very excited about dinosaurs that week you can pull that box out and it's got several everything things, in it everything to do in there rather than just the jigsaws because i don't know about you but the children don't like to do 600 jigsaws maybe three at once <laughs> but you don't need 600 jigsaws of different uh varying topics it's gosh you've been visiting some very large nurseries <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, with, but, with a with a staff issue that pits are missing every at the end of every session with that many jigsaws. Can you imagine? Yeah, so that <laughs> actually really does help with that as well. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I interrupted you. That's you were okay. talking about jigsaws. So having six hundred, I interrupted. <laughs> Obviously, I'm exaggerating. I'm not. Yeah, I realise that. With six hundred, yeah. that would be a lot. So in my nurseries, jigsaws were always put on trays. 
so they were all done before the child so the child saw it complete okay. before um undoing it because i i'm very into child development me if uh, you look at my background that's what my business is all about now um but uh I, I think children need to take things apart. It's like knocking the bricks down before they learn to build the bricks. Um, and so laying jigsaws out whole so the child can see it whole before they yeah. undo it to put yeah. it back again, hopefully then putting it back on the shelf so yeah. that somebody else can use it is a good... Yeah, and then you know all the pieces are there as well. <laughs> and you know all the pieces because you can see it. Yeah. Not going into you know it. those boxes that have like four jigsaws in one they're usually like four piece and then a six piece and then an eight piece mm -hmm. and then a 12 piece or something like that when they now they, i've been playing a pj mask one not on my own i was with a child um and it had one of them had hash like hashtag on the back one of them had dots and one of them had lines um uh, when they didn't used to do that i used to put colored diddy dots on the back so then the child could separate the colors the colors again and do the jigsaws but as it was developmentally appropriate when she got a bit older i took the diddy dots off so then she had to find out which path picture which bit went with which one so you could make it harder as she grew up which really worked because it meant she they were simple jigsaws but the the task got harder because the diddy dots got taken off so there are ways we can organize our settings so then we can apply for the ones that are developmentally at that stage and then encourage them to move on as, as they grow. Mm. That, the, state, the saying that you were talking about with progress, now what, what was your saying? I uh, said per, uh, practice makes perfect, you said yeah, practice makes progression. progression. Because yeah. no one's perfect. <laughs> no, no, I, I've not no, done it yet. So. <laughs> no, that's true. Um, but in in mixed groups you know when you've got children of two and three yeah and four and possibly five if they haven't been snatched off to school quite yet um you know that's quite hard it's quite hard to um organize an environment that meets it meets everybody's needs what do you think um well I, I know we're mainly talking about um, nurseries, but obviously I also work in homes and I've had ages of uh, like 11, seven and three at the same time. I know there's only three children, so it's a lot different because I appreciate there's more children in the nursery setting, but there are ways you can differentiate the outcome or differentiate the, um, the what you're giving them. Um, my great example would be for baking. So for my younger ones, I would I would measure out them and put them in pots and then talk about the consistency, talk about the textures, help them, like tell them which order to do it and talk about them that way. And even maybe like taste the sugar <laughs> and then they can do it themselves. As they get older, I would measure, like let them measure it out for themselves. Yes. Um, and then the last stage would be, I don't tell them what to do at all. I just give them the instructions and the wherewithal, but I'm there for if they need my support. So mm -hmm. um, that's, I know it is trickier when you've got more children and obviously in nurseries, we're talking about younger children. So there are ways you can slightly differentiate tasks so that the more of the able ones mm -hmm. can do it. But I always yeah. love letting the more able ones support the younger ones because they're if they can explain it in their own words, and then that's helping the, or oh, I know, <laughs> two and three, they've got, they, they don't stop talking actually, <laughs> at three years old. Um, they can explain it in sometimes better ways than adults can, um, because they're living the same, they're the same age. Living that life. Experience, yeah. Yeah. Um, in our nurseries, we, we used to do cooking on a regular basis, but we only cooked with a few children each week. Yeah. So, um, but they all had their own bowl. They all did their own their own thing. Anyway, we're going off the subject to do a bit. Um, what about organising? Um, in your book, you've talked about how you've organised things for different heights of children, yeah. and um, and I and I, and also I wouldn't put anybody off having children of two, three, four, and five together. Um, research has actually shown that's really good for all of yeah. them 
or right. and we we've done that in our nurseries however parents need some persuading okay. the parents didn't like it at all to start with even though brothers and sisters could be together yeah. um they didn't get it they really didn't understand it it probably took them a term and a half to see the positive outcome for you know okay. all the children um i would i would recommend that um definitely so we're talking about organizing the resources yeah for different stages of development really um yeah. i mean books on the floor um in crates are very good for little ones yeah i do love having the baskets and and we talked about rotating toys but rotating books is just as important um obviously you'll have your few favorites that you want to keep all the time but the when you do rotate them it just gives them a more more um literature more uh ways to read and and mm. with that actually organizing any space it should have menus it should have you know like takeaway menus it should have recipe books it should also have non-fiction fiction all all sorts of texts because you never know what they're going to pick up and what they're going to be interested in as no. long as they are good examples obviously yeah um people that are listening to us could you write in the um chat what sort of um nursery or preschool or home governor governess or um <laughs> childminder nanny what you'd actually do, we need to get some engagement here. And um, how many children, and what perhaps what age group you work with. And now nobody's going to do it. Oh, yeah, somebody's typing. Wonderful. Oh, <clears throat> you really don't want to just listen to our views. <laughs> okay, Montessori Nursery. Okay, so I've never, I've never worked in a Montessori nursery per se I've inspected them as an Ofsted inspector and I did start doing a Montessori course at one point I actually there's quite a lot of the Montessori method that I really um, agree with although there is part that I don't but anyway we won't get onto that <laughs> but the, the fact that the environment is organized to enable children's learning, I think is really, really important. And, uh, you know, the environment is the third, te is it the third teacher? Yeah. Is it the second? Is it the third teacher? Yeah, the third teacher, what's the second? <laughs> yeah. Um, the environment is, is well, the parent must be the important. first. Yeah. Um, I think the environment's as important as the first two. <laughs> Yes, I must say, uh, I can remember when my eldest, who's now in her th mid 30s, um, was about 18 months, I suppose. Um, she used to take every book off the bookshelf every night. Okay. And my husband <laughs> used to do his nuts. <laughs> Absolutely. And I used to say, she needs to do it. Just let her do it. She needs to do it. And she wasn't at the stage where she could put them back. You know, so we just had a pile of books on yeah. the floor. Um, but um, she did eventually put them back herself. Uh, but she had a fascination for this. And I think often, and, and that I think is where Montessori, Montessori apparatus is fantastic. Because um, they know as soon as they've done it wrong, generally. Mm -hmm. And um, it has an order about it. Yeah. Do you know, my favorite thing about the Montessori way is like the snack station or even like the breakfast stations that you see where the, the child is fully independent and can you use the like get the cereal, pour the milk. And I think that's so important. Actually, pouring is one of the things if we never mm. let them do it, they'll never be able to do it. So I think yeah. it's just something that we we have to be able to support them. Yeah. Do you? It's Virginia. The environment is very important to help us support children. The environment is working well. It totally frees up providing one side. Absolutely. I totally agree. I totally agree. <laughs> I think, uh, but it, there needs to be, there needs to be some, as I said right at the beginning, some, in a sort of way, consideration for rules and respect and 
um, helping children overcome their difficulties of rolling up their mat or carrying something heavy back to the shelf. Um, and that and that goes back to not doing for the children what they can do for themselves in, in many ways. Um, yeah. Are you are you a, a very strict oh, strict's the wrong word, but are you very um uh conventional, perhaps is the right word. That's not quite word any either. Montessori, or do you or do you do a lot of free imaginary play, art and crafts? Eighty okay. percent. <laughs> the thing, the thing about all stuff. um you know like Reggio Emilia, Montessori, or everything, you've got to take the bits that work for your setting and that work for your children, because at the end of the day, you need to know your children. And then obviously we agree that Montessori and the environment are really important, um, but finding the bits that can also help them, it, it's about a balance between all the different things that we've got. Um, I do remember one setting that I inspected and it was beautiful it was really really beautiful um but the children were not allowed to use the apparatus for anything else than what they were what they were intended okay. for and uh and the outdoor environment they had a um uh, a playhouse and they had no respect for what was in the playhouse. Yeah. It was a whole lot of plastic junk, really. Yeah. And you could tell, and it was such a shame, and you could tell that at the end, when, when it's time to go inside, you know, everything was just thrown in for the next session. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, they didn't agree with my outcome. <laughs> <laughs> and, they were, and it was so unfortunate. Fortunate because it, <coughs> oh, yeah. In every other respect, it was beautiful. And I do think environments for children should be beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful in the child's eyes in as much as um, what they need to find out about, what they're yeah. currently interested in and what's, what's making them tick right now. You know, not beautiful for the adults. In my nurseries, we, we yeah. had very few display boards. You know, who are they for? Okay. Um, yeah. I so just... When I I was working in reception for a long time and we had working walls and uh, out of all the displays that I've ever made, the working walls were the ones that made the biggest impact because they changed constantly. They had their children's work there um, and they and it was about a celebration of their work. It wasn't just a display for, like you say, for the adults, because basically that's what we were doing before was just pretty displays with some information on. Um, going back to Alistair Bryce Clay, he was like, what are those words for? You have a drip, a water tray, and it says drip, drop, uh, I don't know, tinkle. Um, okay. They're not for the children because they're not reading them because they can't read. Obviously, we do have some words in the environment because we are helping them to learn their spellings and letters and sounds. Um, but you've got to be sensible about what the environment's for. I noticed Virginia's written about sand and water play. When I was in one of the schools in reception, um, we were banned from letting them put, like they wanted to move the sand to the water and the water to the sand. And I totally understand why you can't do that because we had a budget. We only had enough money for a certain amount of sand. And when that sand ran out, it was gone. But the learning they get from mixing it up and it was also, um, what's that uh, schema where you, transport things transporting schema transporter um, yeah i'm a transporter yeah but <laughs> they also when they mix the sand with the water they obviously the sand works so much differently and it was better when they were experimenting with that than when we were like actually we're going to put some water in today because we want them to make sandcastles like that's not learning that's just telling them what to do so hmm. It's a shame there's not more funding so they can experiment even more. Mm. In our nurseries, we uh, we had sand inside, but eventually we just put the sand outside so it could get wet if we wanted to. And yeah. then we had different sensory trays with herbs or lentils for the older children, yeah. rice, um, uh, corn. Yeah. Well, one of the best learning experiences with water, we put the water outside and 
you know, you've got a rotor and someone's supposed to de like let the water out at the end of the day and someone didn't, don't know who, um, but it ended up being ice. And again, it was an absolute mistake. We didn't mean to, it was an accident, but the learning we got from that mistake was way better than we could have planned. We didn't. But from that, because they were excited and interested and in looking at the melting and, ooh, why is it like this overnight? Um, then obviously we did plan it into our, our um, mm. learning for the children. I mean, that, I think you've just touched on another subject, actually, that is quite topical at the moment, where um, practitioners are not expected to buy Ofsted, not expected by Ofsted, to need to show records and plans of what they're intending to do with the children yes they do need to know the children well and yeah. i think that that not just need to know the children well but need to know where to take the children to next or encourage the children or give them the right opportunities next yeah. um and um i do think that it can't all be in somebody's head I think, you know, that member of staff leaves. Um, yeah. You haven't got any evidence if a child has special educational needs. I, um, this is my hot topic. One of my hot topics at the minute, actually, is that you need to have some records to ensure yeah. that children are developing as they should do, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Would it and not that's really... Sorry. Go, go on. on. Well, I was going to say that's, that can be quite busy. That can be quite difficult in a busy nursery. I do have a solution yeah. for that, but that's another matter. In most nurseries... You know, they find that quite a challenge and that, and yeah. I can understand why the revised EYFS wants practitioners to be with the children. Absolutely. Um, but again, it's getting that balance. But if the environment is right, going back to what, what uh, Virginia was saying, if the environment is right, then you have got, you can actually observe the children step back you don't have to be pick yeah. up the toys all the time yeah. you know you can actually have quality time observing the children not necessarily getting involved but observing children and yeah. then you can adapt the environment to suit their interests and their needs um I can't, yeah okay i'll say that uh, <laughs> i'm a transporter i put everything in boxes and carry them around we we had my my last message is just about to be sold um but we this hopefully before christmas um but we have wheelbarrows and buckets and baskets and um different sorts of uh containers with lids without lids yeah. that sort of thing um i think they're very useful but i'm not really a toy box nursery or a toy okay. box practitioner i'd rather have things out displayed so the children can see although i get your point about putting things away in boxes that are themed i think that's a really good yeah. idea um, well that, that's mainly so then if you've got that box in your storage then you can pull it out and then you can display them can't you and then put them back and absolutely put them yeah in the no, morning true. It, but it's just so then if they're excited about a particular topic then it's easier to just be like i've got a whole resource stock that i can bring out <laughs> And I think that can be quite a challenge, particularly when funding is really tight yeah. and, um, you know, toys are not being replaced as quickly as perhaps yeah. they would have done in the past. Uh, I'm, talk I'm doing a video on that tomorrow night, actually. Um, I've got to get off my soap, or get onto my soapbox. I can't put it off any longer. <laughs> um, and it, I think... I think it can be quite challenging for a lot of settings the you know the resources you know there's been a big push away from providing not providing plastic yes uh, i don't know how you feel about that how does the audience feel about plastic it'd be interesting to see what virginia thinks about that being montessori yeah, it's not very much exactly although yeah. you know the the uh, templates of plastic the yellow we've got yellow and blue ones yeah. um someone's typing <laughs> uh, so but i also think that i'm very opinionated aren't i particularly tonight <laughs> i also think that um anything can be interesting to a child 
if yeah. it's presented in the right way. Uh, old hot water bottles yeah. with different temperatures of water in them, yeah. um, which can be picked up. Well, we've, prob we've probably all got more than one hot water bottle in yeah, our house. Yeah, you've got to be really careful, you know. They're, they're, apparently, it's three years that you can only keep and use properly. Oh, really? okay. Obviously, well, if, you're we... putting, if you're not putting boiling hot water, I think you'll be okay. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> but... Well, we've, I've got stone hot water bottles and metal hot water bottles. I've got all sorts Whoa. of hot water bottles. But for pancake day one year, everybody brought in a frying pan from oh. home. Now, it's amazing the different shapes and sizes and weights and colours and what they're, what they're made, you know, what they're made yeah. out of, as in you can have a cast iron one or you could have an aluminium one. Um, it was amazing how much learning the children got out of a whole lot of, yeah. of frying pans. Um, Mm. yeah so you so you've got tractor uh, tires and boards and bricks um in your outdoor area do you virginia walking sticks poles and pegs and sheets yeah those big um old uh curtains are really good yeah blankets holy blankets because they dry quick <laughs> but, um, when i was doing my gcse's i did a topic on pegs and we had to research pegs that i did not know there was there's about uh, i'm paraphrasing not paraphrasing i'm um exaggerating again 50 different types of pegs and obviously before they were wooden you know the dolly ones that didn't have any springs and then there's so many different types of springs it's it's amazing <laughs> well it's the same with i've done activities with spoons and bowls yeah. You know, you just get every member of staff to bring in a spoon or every child to bring in a spoon yeah. from home. Doesn't matter what sort of spoon. <laughs> and you've got amazing collection of, you know, uh, spoons with monograms on them and yeah. um, spoons that are brass or <laughs> tea caddy spoons, salad servers. You know, you get an amazing amount. Yeah. Um, and uh, certain, I'm a bit of a collector, unfortunately. <laughs> As you can probably tell by the fact, I've probably got about six different hot water bottles that are not rubber. <laughs> and you can't um, use them. <laughs> no, they sit on a shelf, although I'm moving house at the minute. They're just about to go in a box. Um, but, you know, collecting things like that to present as an yeah. interest, yeah. Um, I think, can be quite empowering for language and for discovery um, for children. Yeah. I think it's important to show them, you know, when if you look at like Peepo, you know, the book Peepo and you talk about old, olden days and what they were wearing and what um, how the kitchen is laid out. If you have things that you can show them, it's it's a different experience. If you have things that they yes. can play with, like obviously safely, but um, like, a, is it a mandal, you know, where you put the clothes through and you do that? Yeah, a mangle. Them? Yeah, mangle. I do remember a mangle. Yeah, <laughs> I had a toy. I had a toy one, actually. But it, that kind of thing, if you're there and you're safe with it so that they don't put the fingers in, it, mm. it's, a, it's something else where the environment can help them learn. So they're learning about history, but they're also learning about, well, it's science. It's, uh, and it's, yeah, it's and health and safety. And fine motor. <laughs> health and safety. So, I mean, that's the other thing, isn't it, about environments is the risk assessments that we need to do yeah. and how... Do we put glass objects in our threes to fives room? Do we allow real china? Um, yeah. I'm thinking of the curiosity approach now. And I get, and I totally get, and that's Montessori, isn't it? That children need real objects before yeah. they understand that this china mug, when it's plastic, is still a mug. Let's see what Virginia's written. interesting yeah now i've i've been to china virginia and in china um where, where particularly when it was a one child policy children are incredibly precious to their to their uh, parents and i would say a lot of children in china are put in cotton wool by their parents but in school, where they're having to do things mm -hmm. pro rote, you know, all children are sitting at a desk right. at three, 
Uh, there are some exceptions. There are some exceptions, and I work with some of those exceptions um, with my other job. Um, there are exceptions, but I was in China one particular time and I visited nine or stood outside and watched nine kindergartens in a week. And um, they could be very formal. So you had parents at home doing everything for their children. And then you have schools making the children do things perhaps before they're ready. So they're just learning it pro rote. Yeah. Um, and then you have educators, because I've did some, done some consultancy work more, more than one occasion in China. Educators find it difficult to remember play. Oh, they, find it, they find it very, very hard to remember anything in their childhood about play. I, don't, I, I haven't got to the bottom of that one yet. And then, of course, we had lockdown and I don't think I'll be going back to China soon we've got riots out there today haven't we um uh but uh it's interesting how different cultures yeah view their children and you know i would imagine well i know that in some countries they put their children in a great deal of risk either because they have to to make a living like children stomping over rubbish tips or because they want children to have the thrill of um, bungee jumping. Or, I mean, I'm being extreme yes. now. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? Yeah. You know, they want their children to have the thrill of swimming across yeah. um, a, um, a lake or something, which okay. perhaps here we would feel is inappropriate for their stage yeah. of development. Uh, I was a nanny in South Africa, and um, obviously there's loads of sharks in the sea uh, there in Cape Town. Um, and there was another nanny there who I knew, and she was like, oh, our young children and our teenagers swim in the sea all the time, and everyone knows someone who's lost a leg to a shark. And I'm like, what? In England, we just wouldn't let you in the sea if there was a shark. Like, we just wouldn't, we wouldn't go there, would we? But I suppose no. it's just their life for them. And it's, it's normal. It, it it still blows my mind. Um, but going to Virginia's made a comment about the cotton wool parenting. I think it's even not just cotton wool and wrap them, wrapping them up in a ball. But if we always do things for our children, then we're giving them, we talked about this earlier, like before, learned helplessness. So if they're either, the children, believe they become to believe that they can't do it because they oh can't. someone else always does it for me so I mustn't be good enough and I can't do it and that's awfully sad or the other end of learned helplessness is oh someone always does it for me so I don't have to do it um and at some point they're going to have to do these things uh because they're going well, to be from the characteristics of effective learning point of view in the EYFS I mean we we need to help these children uh, yeah. But I do think it's very disabilitating. I mean, I was a child that was always told there's no such word as can't. Okay. <laughs> you can tell we come perhaps from a different generation as I remember a mangle as well. But, um, <laughs> and I was, I wanted to prove that there was. And that was my objective was to prove okay. that there was at the time. But um, I think it, you know, it, it boils down to who's educating you, doesn't it? Whether yeah. that be a parent or whether that be um, the uh, uh, provisions educator or it could be their peer group yeah you know uh, so hmm. okay right so Virginia is there anything you'd like us to to cover I mean I do I totally agree with you um, that the more freedom we give children, the better. Um, within within a within an environment where we've done that risk assessment. Yeah, but it's it's about setting them up for opportunities. And actually, the the, the um, comments that I made about the ice and the other thing that I've forgotten already. Um, they, I didn't set those, it was an accident, <laughs> those, those opportunities. But then from that, you do learn that you need to set up opportunities for the children that either they might not come to find in other situations mm. or just for them to explore and find out what they do with certain situations as well. Mm. Um, 
I was going to say. I'll something. tell you a story about ice. We, uh, well, not me, I didn't, but some of the, the ladies that worked for me, because they were, well, I might have been some, well, I did have some men that worked for me too. Um, they actually froze um, items in ice, yeah. in big, great big blocks of ice, and then gave the children hammers to get the things out, <laughs> which well, was a variation on woodwork. <laughs> did they wear um, goggles? <laughs> Actually, I don't, yeah, they should have done because that would have been our. I've just done my first aid training on Friday, and it's, I think parents should have to do first aid training actually. Um, But there's many things that we can do in the environment to make it safe, but then we've got to make sure we're not going over the top. So then they are in cotton wool or um, too protected because if they don't take some risks, they're never going to learn. Um, there's a, a meme that says um, they need to take say, like calculated risks. We need them to be able to have an environment where we know we can look after them and, and save mm. them. And but yeah. I think I think it's really good if children do the risk assessment. Actually, yeah. So we we had an outside classroom, and um, uh, when the children went out there, they they had a clipboard, and they walked around to yeah. check. There were no dangers yeah. um, that they should be aware of. Um, and, our, our, really and that was really lovely, actually. Yeah. Uh, we still had to do the risk assessment too. But that, you know, children modelling behaviour is really good for children, isn't it? Yeah. And seeing yeah. you do that will make them think a bit more, I think. Mm. Whereas actually, I, I must admit, I think I've done my risk assessments without the children being involved. I'm always thinking, like, I can't take my risk assessment hat off, unfortunately. And when I go in homes, obviously, it's very different. And I've got to try and be like, this is a home. <laughs> it's not a setting. It's not a nursery. And there are some leniencies, but I would still rather prevent prevent awful, awful um, situations. Mm. I can remember, I mean, I've been in the, I've been in the nursery business and almost 50 years it will be next year and um, and I can remember I can remember not wanting to take photographs of children climbing trees in case the parents were unhappy oh, about okay. it yeah uh, I think now um, we wouldn't have a problem with that on the whole yeah. um, but you know it's about educating the parents to understand these things because they've been brought up probably in cotton wool to yeah. a greater I don't know how old Virginia is <laughs> but certainly I wasn't brought up in cotton wool I was on a farm I was climbing ladders making um going into lofts nobody yeah. knew um in a cow shed nobody yeah. knew my, my brother um, and I used to climb like hay bales but also um I used to wear really pretty dresses and then want to climb a tree and my mum was like you can't wear a pretty dress and climb a tree <laughs> because it will get ruined um so i still climb trees though <laughs> and now i run marathons so yeah <laughs> yeah you do absolutely i wouldn't say i was a tomboy at all but i yeah. had a thing about making houses which has which has um continued through my whole life yeah. you know when you when you when you build houses as a child and then you build nurseries you know yeah. um <laughs> and now i'm planning to do a bit of property development but wow. it's amazing what, only in a very small way, it's amazing what, um, you know, your childhood brings into your yeah. adult life, really. Yeah. I even had a house on wheels at one point. Wow. <laughs> uh, so there you go. Well, I hope that was interesting for you Someone this typing. evening. Let's see what else we have to say. I will tell you about the next spark debate, which will be um, between Christmas and New Year, because we generally have them at the end of the month. And it's going to be with a lady called uh, Amanda Peddle. And Amanda Peddle um, is, I'm not sure what she'd call herself, actually. I don't know what title she gives herself, but she's very um, into how the brain works and how children's behaviors are because their brains are reacting in a certain way so it's, it's going to be a, a, um, a good evening i'm going to learn lots i think um but she's also written some super books a bit like you cat these book people 
Uh, <laughs> so, okay, I'm pleased you enjoyed yourself and perhaps you'll come to the next one. And thank you very much, Kat, for joining me no this problem. evening. Really no enjoyed it. Lovely. Super duper. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us. Thank you.